Hi, my name is Luke Grizzled Turgis, and I made a film called Smoke and Fish, which is about precisely that, smoke and salmon. And the movie's about a lot of other things, and one of the primary things it's about is Native American, Native Alaskan identity. So it's not about identity in this classic, eth I mean, it kind of is, but it isn't about eth identity in an ethnic or racial sense. And it's really more about an identity derived from history, an identity derived from place, from the land, and identity derived from food, which, of course, hence the smoking fish. And we had a lot of reasons for making the film, but on an ideological level, we wanted to reinforce Native Clinket identity, especially among young people. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And there's a lot of people that have been working on this for generations. And we wanted to reinforce that cultural revitalization effort. We also wanted to help non-Natives better understand their Native neighbors and relate to their culture, their history, all of that. And there's kind of a funny story when Corey and I, Corey is the dude I made the film with. This is Corey here. We were talking about all this, trying to figure out what we were doing. And Corey said, so you mean you want to educate white people? And I was like, yeah, more or less. I mean, not just white people, but yeah. And Corey says, well, you know, we've been trying to educate white people for the past 500 years, and it's been pretty ineffective so far. <laughs> and I didn't really have a witty response to that, so I just shut up. But we made an attempt to educate non-natives as well, and I think it's been worthwhile. And a lot of people have done that over the years. I'm going to show a quick trailer from the film so that you know what it's about a little bit more. For a while, I really didn't like it. I didn't want to be Indian. I felt like... I was being punished for something I didn't do. All I could think of was, I just want to be away from it. When it's fishing time, honey, there's no <laughs> messing around. Oh, God. Get the fish! Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Ah. My great-grandma used to be able to cut it just once. It'd all be done. Nobody can step on you once you learn what your house is, who you are, and where you came from, and how you got where you're at. My aunt, Cookie, came and picked me up in San Diego and brought me back to Alaska. I was raised by all these women. I want to say there was seven. Ellen, mm. you want some help cutting them? Uh, do you know how? I'm not always Indian, you know, I'm half white too. Okay. So I got to have half white days. <laughs> the love bird design I was telling you about, the eagle, the raven. You know, I try to keep it as traditional as possible. The Vietnamese knocked off the Persian rug design and we had the chill cap blanket design woven in that so it was kind of like a knockoff of a knockoff so hit me now we on the road again and searching for more people that the working and you struggling and you're hurting right now we know these days you can't be serving finally got my feather so what is coming back we need it right now now everybody has a purpose Corey actually when he was about four years old, hitchhiked 4,000 miles with his aunts from San Diego to Alaska. And he says that growing up in San Diego, he thought he was Mexican. And we got to Alaska, there's like snow on the ground. You've never seen snow before, bears wandering through the yard. A little bit of my own background. I, uh, I thought I was a dog until I was about six or seven years old. I, I grew up at the, yeah. I grew up at the end of a long dirt road in Northern California, 12 miles up the road with no running water or electricity or telephone or anything. And there were no other kids to play with, so I spent all my time playing with the dogs. These are my parents in like 1975 or 76 or something. And I, I went to school at UC Santa Cruz and I studied cultural anthropology. And when I graduated, a bunch of friends and I ended up riding freight trains north through Northern California. I, I got a job on a fishing boat in Alaska. And we went up to, uh, right in Seattle actually, and we went up to Alaska and I got a, um, and when we got there, the captain and I, we had some differences of opinion on some things, and I jumped ship. Huh. I got a ride on a sailboat farther north to Juneau. And this is where I met Corey, and this is how the movie thing kind of started. Corey had this, I met Corey because I was actually sleeping on his floor when he came home. His roommate offered me a place to crash. 
And then Corey offered me a job. He had this bus business. And so I sold bus tickets for his bus business. One of my first experiences with Corey was we took his skiff and we went up the Taku River, which is just south of Juneau. And there's a massive glacier at the mouth of the river called the Taku Glacier. And to me, this is exactly what I'd come to Alaska to experience. It's like, you, you feel so tiny as a human in this landscape. It's just like nature is completely overwhelming. And we're going up past the glacier, and Corey starts yelling to me the story over the sound of the engine about there's a village on this river. At some point, the glacier started advancing, and the people on the upriver side got cut off from the people on the downriver side. For like hundreds of years, families were cut in half, no communication. And at some point, well, the people on the downriver side, eventually like a, a broken piece of a paddle would pop up through the glacier, and they knew that their families were still alive on the other side. And at some point, the people on the upriver side actually paddled through an ice tunnel through the center of the glacier and out the other side and were reunited with their families. So what I'd been looking at is essentially wilderness. In Corey's mind was this completely cultural landscape. It was like history is just written everywhere. It's like a book, like the mountains, the trees, the rivers, the glaciers, the rocks. It's all a cultural landscape. This is my house in San Francisco. It's actually a converted chicken coop in my uncle's backyard. And my family has lived in this neighborhood for about 100 years. There's a park just down the street called Billy Goat Hill, and it's called that because my grandmother used to like, run her goats there. So we kind of feel like old timers in the neighborhood and in the city, um, and we have been there longer than pretty much anyone else I know. We're kind of like a small third world country in the midst of a sort of yuppie neighborhood. But one of the things I realized hanging out with Corey is that there's a tremendous difference having 100 years history in some place and having 10,000 years history. And I knew this, like I, I'd gone to, I studied anthropology in college, but it was really different actually experiencing this firsthand. Another thing Corey told me as we were going up the river is that his boat, being a jet boat, could cross up to 40 feet of dry land as long as there is water to land in on the other side. And literally, about 20 seconds after he said that, we're way out in the middle of the river, going full speed, and uh, we, we just like go <laughs> and come to a dead halt and stick a paddle out in the water. It was about that deep, so we were not crossing any dry land on that trip. Corey at this time, he was really concerned about elders dying and oral history being lost. And my response to that was, dude, go record your grandma telling stories. Go record everyone telling stories. You have a video camera, it's really easy, it'll, it'll be fun. We all love to hear stories. And we talked about it a bit more, and I was like, you know, you'd probably get a grant to do this. At the time, I thought getting grants would be really easy. I'd never tried it before. And um, we thought, you know, you could even get school kids to do it, like give them video cameras and send them out to interview the, their elders. And it would be like a great community project. And I still hope this happens someday. The project didn't happen at the time. We kind of, we made a proposal and we didn't know what to, who to submit it to. But the following summer, Corey invited me to come back up to Alaska and make traditional smoked fish with him. And this is the Chilkat Valley in Klukwan, the place where Corey's family is originally from is about 20 miles up this valley, which is, starts about 100 miles north of Juneau where Corey lives. And this is what Klukwan looks like today. It's kind of a tiny, sleepy town on the riverbank. And this is Klukwan about 100 years ago. And there was a lot more people there. And Klukwan, like 250 years ago, before the smallpox epidemic, was actually like, it was kind of, a, it was a city, it was a regional metropole. People used to come all the way down here to California on trading missions, like paddle canoes down here, and, and to capture slaves. Klukwan is a really old village. Not in Klukwan itself, but the next town over in Chilkoot, the next village over, they found remnants of fish traps that are carbon dated to 4,000 years ago. So people were fishing in Klukwan and stuff when pyramids were being built in Egypt. And it's kind of funny that I mentioned the dates because Clinkett history never has any dates in it, of course. So it's kind of like my own white guy obsession to want to like date things, but it is an obsession I have. Klukwan has also always been kind of an intimidating place. These are Russian cannons that they captured when they sank some Russian ships at the mouth of the Chilkat River in like 1802 or something, or it was a bit later than that. And Klukwan's still intimidating to this day. It takes a while to feel comfortable there. I know someone who lives like right down the road who's lived there for like 15 years and has never been down the street in Klukwan in like 15 years of living a couple miles away. I think my family is kind of history obsessed. This is my Aunt Susie and my grandmother and my great-grandmother Esther. And I remember once at Thanksgiving dinner, Susie pounding on the table. I, someone always ends up pounding on the table at like family dinners in my family. And she's saying, you know, we funded Columbus's expedition. It was our family funded that. And apparently, yeah, 1492 was a bad year for a lot of people. But um, <laughs> apparently, immediately after this, 
we got kicked out of Spain by the Spanish Inquisition, and the Sultan of Turkey sent ships to Spain and took my family to Istanbul. And uh, I guess they actually like passed Columbus's ships in the harbor as they were leaving, which must have really pissed them off. And my Aunt Susie's name was Susie Sultana Ben Ezra, and Sultana in honor of the Sultan of Turkey. That said, I'd say clinkets are easily in order of magnitude more history obsessed than my family is. This is Sally. She's my adopted mom, actually, in Alaska. And when she was a little girl, she's also a character in the film, when she was a little girl, she had to go to school. And when she got home from school, she would spend another four hours with elders. Her parents had hired three old ladies to teach her traditional history. And she had to sit there and listen to stories and repeat them backwards. And she said these old ladies were considered, um, were called encyclopedias. I have another video clip. Nothing is a long time ago. To, to the white man's thought, it was ancient history. But to the Tlingit, it was day before yesterday. And so Corey and I, we spent the summer smoking fish. I actually got kind of good at it, catching them out of the river and, and smoking them in his smokehouse. Corey actually he had a new business plan after that, and he actually hired me to go to India to get Native American artwork made so he could sell it to tourists in Alaska. <laughs> Corey is an entrepreneur. He should have been the, he, we wanted him to come and talk, but he had a trade show to go to. And Corey and I, we ended up not talking for a while because we had some differences of opinion on business management. And eventually when we did start talking again, he called me up and he told me that his grandmother had just died. And he was really close to his grandmother. She was one of the women that raised him. He was raised by all these female relatives. And that before she died, she was asking about that video project, if we were ever going to do it or not. And I thought about it and I was kind of looking for a new project. And so I, thought, I said, sure. And it turns out I just bought a sailboat in South San Francisco for $1,000. And I decided that why not sail it to Alaska? All these, all these things are coming together. And we decided to limit the focus. Rather than doing this big oral history project, we decided to focus on, on food and making traditional smoked fish and Corey's life and his family. And my family, my mom's side of the family is Italian. And I'd say Italians are pretty food obsessed. Perhaps some of you are Italian and know this. And honestly, like, nobody's more food obsessed than Italians. But Clinkets are pretty much at par with Italians on the food obsession. And Sally, just to cover all her bases, married an Italian. He was, a, um, he was working as a butcher on a cruise ship. And she basically shanghaied him. <laughs> There's something really different about getting all your own food directly from the environment in front of you. And a lot of people say that you know, native people do subsistence because they're poor or this or that, but I don't think that's what it's about at all. It's because they just love fish. They like catching fish. They like preparing fish. They like eating fish. They love everything about fish. I mean, there's like other traditional foods people make as well, but especially in Alaska, salmon is maybe like the, the base of the food pyramid. I spent a lot of time thinking about this and, and what exactly I was going to say. And talking here in Silicon Valley, I was thinking, does anyone really care about the past in the same way that people in Alaska do? Is, it, is that relevant? It's kind of like the future is being created here. And what relevance does the past have? And it's very American at some level to not worry about the past. And maybe that's part of what makes us dynamic. We're not encumbered by all this. We're so busy like launching into the future. And so I tried to come up with some like, you know, compelling and rational reasons why it is important to see the world a bit like Clinkets do. And one of them is that not everyone is like us, and if we're going to work with them, like in the sense of geopolitics, in the sense of doing business, just in the sense of personal interactions, it's really important to understand that they're thinking on a really different level than they are. They're working on this like much longer time frame of what's relevant to them. Um, and that was one reason. There's also like a, a, an ecological reason. And it's kind of, there's a cliche that indigenous people are more ecological or more environmental than other people. And you can find examples where they're not, but there's also something really true about when you've spent a thousand years or 10,000 years in the same place. You look at your environment really, really differently, cliche or not, you do. And you treat it a lot differently and you see the future a lot differently. And another thing I thought about is that there's just a sense of humility that comes with looking at time on this time frame. It, it really, it also changes like how small humans are and how small our endeavors are. And the, the things we're doing and thinking about, I mean, back to the ecological thing about sustainability. 
But ultimately, I, I kind of came to the conclusion that beyond all of that, there's something that's like not rational or pragmatic at all. It's just a feeling of a place. It's a feeling of like living somewhere and seeing this all around you. It's completely emotional. And in the end, I'm really grateful to Corey and Sally and some of the other people for sharing that with me, essentially for like taking the time to educate me. I have a, a quote from Sally to finish off. We're gonna need the microphone again. Sure, it's good to have television and, and computers and, and the likes, but your television, you can't eat it, and neither can you eat your computer. There's nothing delicious about it. <laughs> <laughs>